But first, the government takes too much of our money. They light it on fire, they flush the ashes down the toilet, but what if there was a way to pay less? Let's do this. How did we go from fighting a revolution over a 2% tax on a breakfast beverage to what we pay today? And we're taxed on money when we receive it, when we spend it, when we keep it, when we invest it, and even when we die with it. It gets worse. We commute to work to make that money in a car that is taxed again to register on roads we're already taxed to build, fueled by gas that is taxed even further, and many times through tolls that tax you again. And to, that's to maintain bridges and highways and tunnels that already have billions of dollars, taxpayer dollars, allocated to them, and they're still falling apart. And then when you get to your office that is taxed to exist, in a corporation that is also taxed to do business, that almost certainly requires permits and other things, which are another tax, you are paid a paycheck that the corporation must match another payroll tax on top of what they have to pay you. Then you go to a home of which you are taxed to own every single year that we bought with money that the government already taxed us on. Oh, by the way, the more money you make and the more you pay in taxes warrants the government taking more and even higher percentages of your money. Now, if you're angry, hold that thought. Our federal tax code is 2,600 pages, 400 pages longer than the unabridged version of the Webster Dictionary. But if you read that tax law cover to cover and you did your taxes solely based on that, you'd probably go to jail. Why? Because that does not include the over 9,000 pages of additional IRS regulations that were never passed into law, but rather written by some bureaucrat sitting in his office that we still have to abide by. Congress never passed that. But hold up. Because if you somehow misinterpret, forget about, or miss just one aspect of any of those nearly 5 million words in those documents, you might need to defend yourself in an audit. Your lawyer, your accountant, maybe even you, might have to review an additional 70,000 pages of tax law and precedent pertaining to any other part of the words that you may have honestly just missed. Oh, oh by the way, this doesn't even include state and municipal taxes either. What's even crazier... The IRS has the authority to claim you did something wrong, audit you, internally adjudicate your defense that you don't get to be present for, and can unilaterally decide to reach into your bank account and take your money or put liens on your home or your business without even going in front of a judge or getting a warrant. So much for of by and for the people. We revolted on a tax on tea 250 years ago. Our founding fathers are rolling in their graves right now. And what's worse, this has been weaponized before, too, against conservatives, of course. Ironically, against the modern Tea Party, the very people who are calling the IRS a scam. But it wasn't always like this. In fact, in 1895, the Supreme Court ruled any federal taxes against its citizens were unconstitutional. So the government did what the government does best. It protected and expanded itself by passing the 16th Amendment. Now, it says... The Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration. Basically, enter the downfall of America. Basically, the government gave us the middle finger and gave themselves the power to basically do whatever they want and force you to comply at gunpoint. I'm about to explain to you why you should never give the government a fraction of an inch because once the government does something, it never goes away and it only grows. Reagan warned us about this. Now, before the 16th Amendment, before 1913 when it was passed, most government revenues came from trade tariffs or imported goods or something like that. The 16th Amendment changed the calculation of taxes to individuals rather than to the states because the states paid taxes to the federal government based on population after they levied them against its residents prior to that. In 1913, it all started to go downhill. The federal government levied its first individual taxes on citizens. 7% on people making $500,000 or more, which is the equivalent today to $15 million. 6% on 250K to 500K, 5% 5 on 100 to 250K, 4% on 75 to 100K, 3% on 50 to 75K, 2% on 20 to 50K, and 1% on anything else up to $20,000 a year in 1913 dollars which today would be the equivalent of 626 
$1,000 salary. And nearly every year, they tacked on more and more and more and then more and then a little bit more and then a lot more with top tax rates over the years hitting sometimes 90% at one time. Imagine today, though, if you only had to pay a 1% federal tax rate on a $626,000 salary. Wouldn't that be nice? You know what someone taking home that paycheck pays today? Well, at least in 2021? 37%. Today, if you made $626,000 right out the gate, $230,620 of your paycheck goes right out the door to Uncle Sam. Probably over to somebody who hates us, too. In other words, you work for free for the federal government from January 1st to the middle of April. You don't make a dime until four and a half months into the year. Do you feel represented like that? I sure don't. Oh, and after, that, that was after Trump reduced that burden. Again, this does not include state and local taxes. We're not even going to go there today. You pissed yet? I'm super angry. You should be. People back then, though, were more angry about that 1% tax rate than we are about our 37% tax rate today. That is the power of creeping gradualism of government that I'm always warning you guys about. They will always try to get away with more. It's like you put a frog in a pot of boiling water. It just jumps right out, but slowly raise the temperature with him in it. He'll just sit there until he boils. Just want to remind you how much the government sucks. But I, 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 now that I have your attention, folks, what if we could change all that without a revolution? What if we could repeal the 16th Amendment? I'd be willing to bet, with enough pressure and enough people getting loud, we could get two-thirds of the states, of Congress, and all the other required representatives to do it if we had an organized motion and enough noise was made. You know, well, Carl, the federal government needs money to run. Well, I happen to want to defund the whole thing, but yes, to a certain, enough noise was made. You know, well, Carl, the federal government needs money to run. Well, I happen to want to defund the whole thing, but yes, to a certain degree, the federal government does need some money. They do do a couple good things. But someone's already thought about this. Stephen D. Redden, to be more specific. And this guy, he just randomly mailed me this pamphlet the other day. It ended up on my desk. I took it out and read it. I was like, well, hot damn, let's hear it. He has proposed repealing and replacing the 16th Amendment with essentially a consumption tax. I mean, we've heard this before, but this is interesting. Where you would keep 100%, or at least from the federal government, 100% of your paycheck, and a small tax would be levied on items you purchase, from $1, a $1 pack of gum to a billionaire's yacht to a private jet, whatever. Epstein's Island. You would pay taxes based on what you spend. The lowest federal tax rate is currently 12%. So many people would instantly, in that tax bracket, get a 12% raise. But this new proposed tax would be less than 12%. That would be like a six-pack of Red Bull for the economy. Stephen Redden himself, founder of Now Tax USA. Sir, I, I got this pamphlet. I don't know who put it on my desk, but someone did. I read it, and I was like, this is a thing. But here's the talking point that I've been worried about. People would say this would disproportionately for, uh, affect the lower to middle class. What do you say? Actually, uh, the way it's structured... It taxes, um, it, it is actually called a broad base uh, national, uh, national sales of goods, services, and transactions. So what we do is we spread the tax across all bases of uh, income, all segments of the economy. And so what happens is when you do that, you're actually, everyone is paying as you're, as you're going. To, to, to make simplify it, you buy a candy bar and a Coke, you've paid your taxes, if you were to buy materials for your factory, you pay your taxes, just a 1% tax. Because what people don't realize is we have about a $500 trillion a year economy, and no one really knows what that real true number is, but it could be as much as with stocks and bonds, $750 trillion a year. Multiply that by 1%, that's $7.5 trillion, which covers our budget and starts to pay down the debt. <laughs> Little things. It's called TEST. We've actually come up with a, an acronym, TEST, Total Economy of Sales, Services, and Transactions, which actually daily on deposits would track the economy 100%, and it would supplant GDP. You no longer need GDP because you could daily get the reports That's, of exactly where the economy's at. Sir, this is, like, incredible. Of course a government didn't come up with this because it's too, it's too simple. <laughs> um, but... 
So you, we would actually take more in revenue. People would pay less. Certain people would pay less taxes, and it would be. I mean, I'm sure you could waive certain things like basic food and things like that if you had to to to, to in, in, you know help implement this. But how is this not like every single person in every single state screaming with pitchforks for this? Well, actually, uh, it's a good point. Uh, Governor Nome in South Dakota does a, a version, a sales tax version. We're not a sales tax. We go way beyond sales tax. We, it sounds bad. We tax everything, but we tax everything at such a low rate that uh, it's nominal. But uh, Governor Nome, she did an expanded uh, expanded version of a sales tax, which I call a broad based sales tax. And in South Dakota, there's no income tax or property tax. Mm -hmm. So there's proof that the concept works and is working already. And additionally, if states were to adapt this program, you could see where there would no be no longer be property taxes as well which as you brought out in your monologue, the government giving themselves the right to take your property is in direct opposition of our founders. Mm -hmm. uh, and my, it, my it, I can say life, liberty, property, wealth, individual sovereignty. <clears throat> it should be what the Declaration of Independence says. Right, but uh, Stephen, let's go into the implementation of this. Obviously you could repeal the 16th Amendment, which would default us back to the Supreme Court decision of 1895 that says the federal government can't tax your income, which would be Fabulous, if I could just tell them to pound sand. Um, but then we implement this at the same time. You Obviously, government always likes to expand. Would you, impl let's call this, you, you know, it doesn't even have to be an amendment. It could just be, you know, a, a law on this type of thing. Why can't we get more motion behind this? How do you get this implemented? Have you started going to states like Convention of the States and some of these other groups and reaching out to them? This is a fabulous idea. I can't believe this is not bigger news. Well, I started in 2011 developing this, but we just started in August of last year promoting full time. So we've only been doing it six months and uh, we're starting to get a lot of traction. And thanks to you, we're getting even more traction and probably after today, a lot more traction. And um, the implementation of this is, is easy because the infrastructure for it is already in place. It's the federal banks upon deposit every day. The, the banks take 1% and it automatically goes to the feds. So you can see it's a cash system, which is no more filings, forms, um, late taxes. It, it, it's just a cash system, mm -hmm. which keeps the government solvent as well and keeps the, the government off our back. Yeah. It's also interesting, like like I was saying, like 2,600 page tax code. This is what, what could you put this on? A, a, a notebook page? It's actually one page, 740 ah! words. <laughs> that would be something. Could you imagine the government doing something that simple? Well, I, actually, I can because I think inevitably this will be the tax system you're going to have to use because there's no other tax system. Let's take the current tax system falls short of trillion a year. All the new proposed tax systems, flat tax, fair tax, they have the same problem where it's very noble cause yeah. to try to reform our tax system. They fall short because of the expenses and none of the new reform tax systems or our current system addresses the uh, the the elephant in the room, not the elephant in the room, yeah. <laughs> but the thirty four trillion dollar debt, and not to mention the the solvency of uh, Medicare and yeah. Social Security. This is the only way that we can actually start solving our over over large looming problems and lowering taxes for all citizens. I agree. I mean, look, Stephen, I hate government. I hate taxes even more. I think this is a fabulous idea. I want to stay involved in this and help you guys any way you can. Because You'd have to repeal the 16th Amendment simultaneously because you know the government Absolutely. will then Absolutely. start taxing you under both at that point. Stephen yeah, Redden, I appreciate you being here, sir. Great idea. Well, thank you, Carl. It's yeah. been a pleasure. <laughs> to think, that guy just randomly mailed that to me anonymously. Coming up, we're going to break down Pennsylvania's latest ruling on mail-in ballots and why the left is freaking out next on Frontline.